This episode is brought to you by the Arvada Center. Experience the regional premiere of the off-Broadway hit Natasha, Pierre, and the Great Comet of 1812 running February 16th through March 31st. This musical extravaganza brings futuristic electropop sounds to a scandalous slice of war and peace as the venue transforms into a Russian cabaret with immersive bar and table seating. Don't wait. Get your tickets now for Natasha, Pierre, and the Great Comet of 1812 at arvadacenter.org slash events. That's arvadacenter.org slash events. Today on CityCast Denver, there's a nondescript office building on 38th Avenue, just across from the Illegal Pete's, where a reclusive billionaire pulls the strings of a company that controls an astonishing 85% of the global market for pizza cheese. Yes, that's the low-cost, low-quality mozzarella you've eaten if you've ever had Pizza Hut, Domino's, or Papa John's. James Laprino is their exclusive provider. But for the past few years, he's been in a legal battle with his own family that's drawn him into the spotlight. Last Thursday, the Colorado Court of Appeals rejected his niece's appeal of a December 2022 ruling in the patriarch's favor. So we're delighted to share my conversation with Westwood reporter Helen X, who was in the courtroom when the Laprino family drama first spilled into public. Today is Monday, January 29th. I'm Paul Caroli, and here's what Denver's talking about. Helen X, welcome to CityCast Denver. Thank you. So Helen, we have to start with the man at the center of this whole story. Who is James Leprino? Yeah, so James Leprino is this fascinating character in Denver. And I I really feel like most people have never heard of him. Maybe they've heard of Leprino Foods, but they probably don't know anything about the family behind it. But James Leprino, he is the son of immigrants And he is the son of immigrants who started a small Italian grocery store in Denver's Little Italy. He kind of grew up in the grocery store business. Uh, There was some cheese making happening in the grocery store, but it was very much more like a deli and kind of serving a lot of cold cuts and pantry items. And when it ended up having to fold because a larger grocery chain was moving into town, he had already started to get the idea of cheese being a moneymaker. He was looking around and all these pizzerias were popping up. He was noticing how popular pizza was with the neighborhood kids. And so in 1958, he started the Prino Foods Company with, I think, Forbes reported $615 in his pocket. So so a really American dream story. Wow. So with almost nothing, you know, just being scrappy and entrepreneurial, he has a very good business sense. You know, he's been able to grow Leprino Foods into a multi-billion dollar company that today provides 85% of the world's pizza cheese. He's the exclusive provider to Pizza Hut, Domino's, Papa John's. His cheese is on a ton of frozen meals like Stouffer's and Marie Callender meals. And th- there's a very, very high chance that you have consumed a lot of Laprino food cheese mozzarella and you've just never known about it. And it's a private company headquartered in Denver. It's still family owned. Um, and so it's it's this crazy American dream story of a son of immigrants rising to be you know one of the top billionaires in America. It really is an incredible story. I love the um, the photo in one of your pieces for Westward, the black and white photo. I think it's of uh, James's father standing in the uh, the little corner market on Thirty Eighth Avenue, and it's like this guy took this small corner store like a tiny little grocery store and grew it into this global cheese empire. I love it. It is incredible. It is incredible. And no one knows about it. Why don't we know about it? They're extremely private. They're a private company, so that already allows them a bit of a shield from the public, right? They don't have to report out on financials. They don't have thousands of shareholders. They don't have huge investor firms bugging them about their finances and performance. And then I think personally, the family has just been very private. There's Before this trial started, there was only one publicly available photo of James G. Laprino. From 1987. Yes. he's. I think he's like 38 or something. I, f- I forget how old <laughs> he is in that photo, but it's been a long time. And there's only one interview with him on record, which is this 2017 Forbes article. And I have no idea how they convinced him to do it. I think even in the article, he's quoted saying something like, I can't believe I agreed to this. I 
I don't want to do this. <laughs> So just, he's, oh, they're boy. just a very private company, a uh, private family. And because they're a private company, the world has allowed them to be private. Mm -hmm. um, so before we get into the trial, which has really given us our, our first proper look into the company and into the family dynamics behind it, can you just explain how, how did he corner the market on this specific type of low quality, low cost mozzarella cheese from Denver? I think it's a combination of in the beginning, he was willing to serve that low cost market, right? So the same year mm -hmm. he founded Leprino Foods, that's when Pizza Hut was founded. I think Little Caesars was started a, maybe a year afterwards. Domino started delivering pizza around that time. So he was in at the right time at the very beginning. And what all those chains needed at that moment was low cost, reliable mozzarella cheese. Cheese is one of the biggest cost drivers of a pizza. He was able to step into that space and provide them something that's consistent, that's reliable, and also low cost. And the way he was able to do that is really leveraging a lot of technology, right? Like he was not one of these artisan crafters of mozzarella cheese from the old world. He didn't really care about that history and culture. He was like, give me all the additives, give me all the chemicals. You know, he <laughs> he hired a lot of food scientists and and engineers to really figure out how to make a consistent product that tasted good enough, but more importantly, just was consistent and reliable. I don't think they've ever had a recall. Up to today, Leprino Foods has never had a recall for cheese, which cheese is a very, very bacteria vulnerable product. So that's kind of an amazing success story in itself. Huh. Uh, and then he was able to leverage a lot of his... He's a great businessman from what I'm reading is that he was able to really develop these personal relationships with all these huge pizza chains. You know, there's a paragraph in this Forbes article that says... When Domino's entered into an exclusive supplier relationship with Leprino, it was a one-page contract. Can you even imagine these days, right? It was very no. much like a trust. To Domino's. Yes. And wow. admittedly, you know, this is back in the 80s and, and 70s. Business was done a little bit more old boys club, but he was able to establish these great relationships. He was able to constantly deliver. He was able to constantly evolve the technology of his cheese making to serve their needs best. Uh, so, you know, there's a, he has 50 patents or something like that. There's just a ton of stuff that they've done in the food science of developing cheese. They reduce the aging process to four hours. So they can take milk in to the factory and then produce mozzarella cheese in less than four hours. All of that combined with, as he got more and more successful, he invested in a lot of expansion. So they have a, a hundred acre factory in Greeley, Colorado. And at that scale, that means that you can produce so much more at low cost, meaning you can capture such a bigger margin, offer the lower prices to your customers. And so I think all of these factors is just kind of contributed to him like dominating the pizza cheese market. So we knew he was very successful. We knew this was a private company and we knew he was very reclusive, but we didn't really know very much about the inner workings of the company or or the family. This is still a family company at the end of the day. Um, until this trial that happened earlier this week, the whole Leprino family was fighting over, over his fortune, over his company. Can you, can you explain why the Leprino family was in court this month? Yeah. So this goes back to 1965. So Leprino Foods was founded in 1958. So this is about seven years afterwards. And Jim Leprino had his cheese company and his older brother, Michael Jr. Leprino, was an independently successful businessman. He was in commercial real estate. He was in banking. And the story that I have been told by the lawyers is that their parents sat them down and they were honestly concerned about Jim and his prospects, right? Like, you run a cheese company, huh. it's going okay, but we're very were concerned about your financial stability and prospects. And so they asked the two brothers to exchange 25% of each other's business with each other. And, and very much kind of, in my feeling, it's a very old Italian, you know, you take care of the family. And, so, and that deal obviously ended up benefiting Michael Jr.'s family a lot more than it benefited Jim Leprino's family because G Leprino Foods went on to become a multi-billion dollar company. Michael Jr. was very successful, but not to the level of 
billions of dollars, you know, <laughs> supplying 85% of the world's pizza cheese. And so there's always been this kind of split in ownership at the company. Majority shareholders are Jim Laprino, and then eventually he sold a lot of his shares to his two daughters. And then Michael Seniors, uh, sorry, Michael Jr.'s side of the family, same thing happened. He owns 25% and eventually sold it into trust or passed it into trust for his three daughters. Jim's side of the family is very active in the business. Uh, the two daughters hold active positions in the company. Jim's made it no secret that he wants them to succeed him. He wants them to take over the company. And on the other side, it's a little bit more passive. They don't hold active positions in the company. They have independent careers or independent lives. And so that's kind of the setup for the the food fight, I guess. <laughs> Hey, it's Paul Caroli, executive producer with CityCast Denver. You remember that time when I went to that retirement community to interview that mayoral candidate no one else was taking seriously, Renata Behrens? That was such a fun day for me, and I'm so glad that I got to bring her story and her actual ideas for the mayor's office to a much, much bigger audience than she'd had. And you know what? If it wasn't for CityCast Denver, I'm not sure any of us would have ever gotten to know Renata Behrens. So become a member of CityCast Denver today and uh, make sure we can keep doing that kind of thing for a long, long time to come. You also get to enjoy special perks like ad-free listening, event invites, and members-only updates. Just go to membership.citycast.fm. Thanks. There's a big difference between talking and reporting, especially right now with a fire hose worth of news coming your way. You know what helps? Having reporters in the field. I'm Brad Milkey from ABC News, and that's what we've got on ABC's daily podcast, Start Here. Every morning, Start Here takes you across the country and around the world for a quick, smart look at the stories that matter. It's fast, it's straightforward, and sometimes, gasp, news can even be fun. So let's meet up tomorrow morning. Listen to Start Here wherever you get your podcasts. So tell me, tell me about the case itself, Helen. What are these nieces suing Luprino over? If I was to ask the lawyers, they would say this case is about a breach in fiduciary duty. And there was two breaches that they alleged. Probably the most people paid attention to and was a big focus of the trial was in 2017, Jim and the majority shareholders voted to convert the company from an S corporation to a C corporation. Now, only the majority shareholders voted on that. And what, what happens when you do a conversion is that all of the profits that were made under the S corporation are required to be distributed to the shareholders. So in this case, Jim and his family got $405 million, and then his nieces got $90 million, a ton of money. But almost three days after that $405 million hit the uh, Jim Laprino's family's bank account, they turned around and they loaned it back to the company for 2.68% interest. And so they're able to make now a yearly cash flow off of this one-time disbursement that they loaned back. They're able to make millions and millions of dollars of cash flow every single year where the nieces got their one-time $90 million payout and they did not get the opportunity to loan it back to the company. And the company has made it part of their bylines that they do not give dividends to their shareholders. So in a way, this $90 million payout is kind of the last payout these nieces will ever see, theoretically. Hmm. And they are upset about that. I'm they guessing. are upset. They are upset that they that $90 million payout was the last payout that they'll ever see and that they'll never be able to get consistent cash flow from their 25% ownership of the Laprino Foods Company again. And they didn't get the mm. opportunity to vote. They didn't get the opportunity to be informed. They basically say they got the disbursement and that was like, goodbye, end of story. Mm. I see. But Helen, I, I have to say, you quoted one of the lawyers as saying several times, this isn't about the money. If that's true, what was the trial about? That was the plaintiff's argument. They very much characterize the nieces as wanting to be accepted back and a 
part, an active part of the company. Again, they wanted to be able to attend shareholder meetings. They wanted shareholder meetings to be held and they wanted to be invited. They wanted a voice in major business decisions. They wanted to be involved and have some control over the ownership that they have of the company. And so I think that's where his uh, his quote comes from of, it's not about the money, it's not about the money. But I mean, at the end of the day, they were asking for almost a billion dollars. So I feel like it was a little bit about the money. <laughs> a little bit about the money. It's about the family coming together, but a tiny bit about the billion dollars. Yeah. yeah. I think you have to understand, I think this case has been going on for two and a half years. I think the emotional confrontation part of it is long over. They, at this point, are, they do a good job of avoiding each other. You know, it's in a courtroom, it's very much like a wedding. You have a groom side and a bride side. In a courtroom, you have a plaintiff side and a defense side. And they just stay to their corners. They don't make eye contact when they have to pass each other in the hallways. It's a very, you know, studied, like, I'm not looking at you. And I'm not going to cause drama. There was no scenes. There was nothing like that. Just kind of a cold awkwardness, I think, between the two sides of the family. Hmm. So how did the trial play out in the end? So the the jury ruled in favor of the defendants. So in favor of Laprino Foods Company, Jim Laprino and his immediate family. And it, they did not award the nieces any amount of settlement. They were asking anywhere from 600 to $900 million. And that would have been the responsibility of the jury to decide how much. Hmm. Well, Helen, now that the trial is settled, I assume Mr. Laprino will go back to wherever it is he does, whatever he, wherever he lives, wherever he goes. He's 84 years old. He's not going to be able to run this company forever. Is there any reason to think that Denver will at some point lose its place as the capital of low cost, low quality pizza cheese? I honestly don't think so. He set up this company to be successful for at least another generation, if not more. All of the infrastructure that they've built is going to last, you know, for the next generation or two. And a lot of their scientific breakthroughs and food science breakthroughs, I mean, that's really become their their unique value proposition and that's not going away anytime soon. I honestly think we'll see his grandchildren, you know, in the same position, dominating the pizza cheese market. Maybe they'll increase from 85% to 100%. There's been a lot of churn in the in the cheese industry lately. And I think they're fully set up. Well, Helen X, thanks so much for joining me on CityCast Denver. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was awesome to talk about. As I mentioned earlier, the Colorado Court of Appeals last week rejected the Laprino niece's appeal of the 2022 ruling in James Laprino's favor that Helen just described. None of the Laprinos spoke to the press after this most recent ruling, and the now 86-year-old multi-billionaire remains in full control of his global pizza empire. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed the show, why not take a minute to tell your pizza delivery person about us? Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See you then. Hello, hello, test.